Okay, here we go. Uh, hi, hello everyone. So uh, thanks for spending the Friday evening uh, um, listening to how to build a web tree. So my name is Edison from Achilles and Achilles is a marketing technology company based in Singapore. Uh, we built um, we built software solutions to make marketing more efficient and transparent. And uh, the reason why I'm giving this talk is because uh, as part of the technology stack that we use, blockchain is actually a very important portion of it. And, um, and I'm in this blockchain space for the past uh, three years, uh, starting out all the way from grad school, uh, where I was researching on blockchain and my first job in uh, Zoveka, which is a public blockchain based in Singapore. So, um, so yeah, so I'm here to share, share with you what, what I've learned about this um, amazing technology and what it takes to build an application on that. So the agenda that, that we, I'm, I'm going to cover today is very briefly what is a blockchain from the software engineer's perspective, uh, and also getting started with some, some tips about how you can build your applications on a, on a blockchain, like Ethereum. So starting from a very, um, very high level question is that um, I think many of you already know how to build a simple application. It can be as simple as a, a web application and, and you know how to make certain, uh, certain uh, requests and response. But how is it good? Um, and um, so how, how is blockchain different? So let's go back to the, to the fundamentals. I'm a little bit of purist, so to me, blockchain, the definition of blockchain is this, and it, it is from the blockchain, it's from the Bitcoin white paper. Um, because after, after being in this space a while, you start to see that many people claim that they have a blockchain, but they don't really have this concept of blocks and chain. So it's kind of like strange. Um, so we start off with this problem of like transactions. So transactions, in a very briefly, is that let's say I want to send you a Bitcoin. Uh, what happens is that I use my private key to sign a transaction, and uh, we get a we get a signature. And um, if someone else wants to pass on that that Bitcoin to someone else, then um, you will sign on the hash itself. And um, along the way, we can always verify uh, based on the chain of signatures and uh, trace it to verify whether if someone has a blockchain or not uh, has a has a Bitcoin or not. And um, so after all, all of this is done, uh, because that's a transaction kind of like sequences, so we, we go on to the blocks. And uh, on every block on the, on the Bitcoin network, which uh, usually is usually one block every few minutes, uh, you get a, a block with multiple transactions inside. And um, at a high level, there is a, there's, a, there's a previous hash of, a previous hash of the previous block and the, the nonce of the, of, the of the new block. And uh, it will go on and go on and go on forever, and um, it is an infinite state machine. So um, fast forward um, six years later, so Bitcoin came in 2009, and in 2015, there is Ethereum. Uh, we started to get introduced to this concept called smart contracts, which is, I think, where most of the exciting things come from. Uh, smart contracts are basically pieces of computer code on the blockchain that automatically executes itself. So if someone wants to say that, all right, if only this condition is met, then I, then I authorize the payment. So um, contracts and users can send transactions to each other. So contracts, like smart contract can call another, another smart contract and users can also call a smart contract to, to evoke certain, trans uh, uh, certain functions. So um, we go on to move into what is like uh, Ethereum, which is like an infinite state machine. So let's begin with the first state. So let's say everyone has like $100 in the, in the ledger. And uh, we make a transaction called like at least transfer fifty dollars to Bob. Uh, so on the on the new state, the the state will be changed, and uh, this goes on forever. And um, all this transaction and this verification is agreed by a global network of nodes uh, that are operated by miners, and this is modified over time uh, by transactions. So in a more technical and more um, theoretical way, and this is this is it. Um, what we call is the infinite state machine is because Whenever you have transaction, uh, transactions in, the state changes, and uh, the state changes, and it changes over time. So it is a very, uh, it is, um, it is one of the concepts of like computer science of like state machines. There are infinite state machines and there are discrete state machines. Um, why am I saying this? Is because it's very important for the for the subsequent um, thinking around how you reason about smart contracts. So in a, in I think where the exciting things for software engineers is that blockchain and smart contract programming. It's interesting in this field is one, smart contract is complex. So a piece of code, which is like maybe say 20 or uh, which could be as little as like say 30 lines all the way to 300 lines, it is quite rare to even see a smart contract that is like 1000 lines. And this smart contract has to do a lot of things. It must be able to store data. 
it must be able to declare functions and it must be able to do uh, manipulations and arithmetic like addition, subtraction, multiplication, etc. So this 1,000 lines of code, which is, uh, which is going to be very little compared to what many of us are used to in, uh, in our, our daily work, is that it contains a bunch of logic and uh, it can get quite complex over time. So being able to think about this in the, in the, in the time frame of like, I need to do so many things in this 1,000 line. How do I do it in the most effective way? It's one of the challenges here. And also, that, I think the second thing is that uh, because um, when, a, when, a, when a smart contract is being deployed, it is like a honeypot on the, on the Ethereum. There's just so much money there, and uh, if, you, if you are not careful with how you program it, then that's where money can be lost because um, on, a, on an Ethereum blockchain, it could store like cryptocurrency, and this represents money. So um, this is actually something that the developers are, have to be, have to be ca uh, cautious about. The scary thing is that as developer, we only know how to prevent ourselves from bugs when we can foresee this. Like for example, I can only write test cases that I think that this will go wrong, uh, but we do not know exactly what will what will. So we we know we, we may think that we know what, what is going uh, going to go wrong, but we also do not know actually what might go wrong. So what what it means is that you might um, because if a developer miss out on some test cases, that's where things break. And uh, on the on the blockchain or smart contract, this could be dis disastrous. So, um, so in in three lines, what makes development on blockchain different is that uh, 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 smart contracts are very complex, and it must be able to store states and able to communicate with other smart contracts. So, um, and also transactions are not free because um, the computations needs to be calculated ahead of time. So you need to know how much gas or how much how much credits you, you think of gas as a credit that you want to allocate the, the sufficient amount so that you can call it. And uh, blockchain is immutable. So once you push a new code up, out there, you cannot update it as simple as like say, oh, patch the version. So you need to be very careful of what happens when you push a code to the, to the blockchain network because if there's a bug, it's very hard to fix it. So, so yeah, so those are, those are the few things here that, uh, that I think is very interesting about blockchain and also, uh, I mean, from the, from the perspective of application developer, I mean, I came from the, from the background that I, I do both. Like, so we have applications and we have a blockchain component. So sometimes I have to learn how to change between two mindsets. All right, so um, uh, starting with very, very practical things about how do you get started with uh, blockchain smart contract programming. Um, the one on the left side is where we are most familiar with. So you have a web dashboard, you point to a server, you point to a database, um, and uh, this is what most software is. But on the blockchain network, right, you could connect directly to this like network of nodes all over the world. So on this blockchain itself, there is uh, going to be things like uh, smart contracts, and there are going to be things like accounts. So um, and uh, it is very complex. And what do I mean by complex? So if we try to draw out the, the entire workflow and the state transition of a smart contract, it could start off with this. So let's say I'm account S. I could make a transaction to, to a smart contract C. And uh, the smart contract C could, multiple, could call multiple transactions to contract D, could send out some tokens to uh, account Y, can, can evoke another smart contract called contract E. And, um, and uh, this can go on uh, for a certain amount of depth uh, because um, and also like, and uh, sometimes like, let's say if you call contract E, the contract E can also re-enter contract C again. So this means that when you want to actually make sure that you don't, uh, uh, you, you program correctly, you also must draw a similar state transition graph um, because there are some history where um, the one on the top right, that actually, that's actually a, a real security flaw that happened in the 2017. Interacting with blockchain using wallets. So if we go back to here, like going back before, um, I mean that, that presentation on Casping was great because you have, a, you have an authentication part. But for blockchain, how do you authenticate? So that is, on, uh, that is being sent directly when you have a presence of a private key, when a private key is just a bunch of hexadecimal string over there. And uh, what it generates is that it generates a public key, which will allow you to, um, to be able to verify your, your uh, your identity on the blockchain and the private key also helps you to sign transactions. So let's say I want to send Michael some amount of like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, then I will need to sign a transaction with my private key, point it to Michael's address and that's how a transaction happens. 
so going into this um, is that if we if we if we have an application, uh, we we not we usually uh, this web application usually interact with a blockchain through a RPC. So it's not like a magical thing where you have to run a you have to run a a, a blockchain network or node on your computer. So you could point it to some hosted services. Um, this slide is on Zelika, which was a uh, which which is which has its own own ways. But on Ethereum, there are services like Infura that can provide you with these hosted services and an interface that you can call easily. So this is how you can actually build a web application. So um, going into Ethereum use case, right? So let's say if you have a client application, a front-end dashboard, what you will do to connect to the web tree is that you can choose to install like a MetaMask. You can choose to ask your users to install a MetaMask extension. So this is like a Chrome extension that is uh, on your browser. You can stick in your private key and uh, you can actually use that you uh, use that to actually interact with uh, Web3 uh, familiar applications. So uh, recently on uh, Forbes, right, you can actually pay using using your uh, using Ethereum. So if you want to pay for a subscription of Forbes.com, uh, and you have this MetaMask extension enabled, you can actually authorize the payment. So all these things does not require you to put in your credit card number. It's uh, it's very fast free, and uh, it, it is not just powerful for just um, Sending Ethereum or paying for micro transactions. Why is it micro transaction? Uh, it is also useful for providing identity. So, um, yeah, I think that once this actually takes off, like micro transactions can be a thing because on the internet world, right, credit card trans transactions are very expensive. Not sure if anyone here is from Stripe, but Stripe earns a lot of money just by processing tra credit card transactions. So. We hope that that will go away someday, uh, where transactions can be in the in the fraction of a cent, and that's how Zilliqa transactions are. Uh, everything costs less than a cent, so uh, you don't have to pay for 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 this like hefty credit card bills. Okay, so and all these things will actually interact with like um you can choose to interact with a local test net for development. Uh, that will allow you to test your application and uh, uh making sure that it's production ready. And once they're ready, you can push it to the main Ethereum network. And this can be either you host your own node, which is a gateway to this network, or you could use a hosted service like Infura. So um, this is like a, maybe like a more illustrative like kind of like thing with a more advanced concept called IPFS. So let's let's imagine that I'm trying to build a Twitter application on the decentralized application. So this is how I'm going to build it. Uh, I will use my standard React uh, React JS application as a web front end. I'll collect certain things like the tweet that you want to make as a string, I will allow you to upload a picture. So once that is done, right, I will actually send it to the IPFS, which is which stands for Interplanetary File System. It is a decentralized file system that allows you to host like image. Think of it like S3 bucket, but on the decentralized web. So Amazon S3 bucket, so like a Dropbox. So when you when you, when you when you put your files there, you um, they will return you a hash, and uh, you can put a hash on the Ethereum blockchain. To show that okay, this is the content that I have, and this is the the sort of like URL or I call it IPFS URL to that image there. Because the whole idea of blockchain is that it's decentralized. So let's say if you put it on like AWS or you put it on Google, one day they may take it down, or one day you may get censored or blocked by a domain. But if you put it on the blockchain and the IPFS is very censorship free. This will return a result. Once I put it into Ethereum, you get an Ethereum hash, and uh, that's where you can display to your user that, yes, I received a tweet and a picture. This is the hash that is being on on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, whenever people want to, say, interact with your content, so let's say that uh, maybe your tweet has a, has a donate button, what you could do is that you, you, have, you may have a Node.js server, and this Node.js server could also receive events from the Ethereum blockchain, so like a socket connection. So this is where you can actually receive things like a push notification through, uh, and also push it back to your front end. So um, some things are, are good for the for the blockchain, but always remember that blockchain is not suitable for storing everything. So some things do must store in a standard MongoDB. So uh, I usually like to tell people that blockchain is an extremely expensive database. It is not ideal for storing big data or doing all kinds of like saying. Um, large transactions. I mean, it's cool that people put like banana trails and audit trail on the blockchain, but you should try not to do so much of it because it can get pretty expensive. Um, so yeah, so this is an overall view of how I will build a web front end. And um, I think maybe I just want to just go very briefly into uh, some of the security attacks because uh, I think security is one of the most important 
topics to cover in a smart contract programming. The key question here is that is the answer is that are we safe in this like uh, smart contract space? So in the past few years, we have seen quite a lot of things like the DAO attack, which happened in twenty sixteen. Uh, that's where a reentrancy attack. So going back to the the, the complicated graph, that like someone sends to a contract, the contract sends to another place and uh, it re-enters a contract. That's a DAO attack, which I have an illustration for that later on. Uh, there's a parity bug where someone accidentally frees a multi-signature contract. And uh, so far, we have been good. At, um, I think that I, I should have updated this slide with 2020 because recently there was another smart contract that got exploited and multi-million dollar is being lost. So um, uh, it, it can get quite sophisticated over time and, um, and I think that this will, will always go on. So this is like um, based on a research paper published by NUS. Uh, it says that all of uh, all the smart contracts out there, there are quite a significant number, uh, number of contracts that are vulnerable. So there are plenty of things. If you are coming from the angle of a cybersecurity, there's lots of things to do on the on the on the smart contract portion. So going to this, like this is exactly what happened in the DAO attack and how things may go wrong. So let's say that I have a fundraising contract, and uh, it means that I I just want to get the amount of funds from the contributors uh, from from the contributor. And I say that okay, if um, and I'm gonna reset that to, to zero. Uh, I'm gonna send I'm gonna send some money from from the from the sender to uh to uh to an account, and um. And you you call another you you, you try to send a transaction to a to a person. So usually this means that I I will be sending money to a to a person, but in this case right, what happens is that someone actually you instead of like because this this function this code actually works if that recipient is a user but this code does not work so well when the user is not a so when the recipient is not a user account but it is a smart contract so in this case what happened in 2016 was that someone discovered this uh, exploit and they wrote another smart contract to basically point it back to here so as you can tell like from from this like from the last line right that's where that's where the contributors get to zero uh, so that's where you reset the balance back to zero because like um, so because whenever someone calls this and uh, you just enter a loop all, uh, all along and um, the, the contributor's amount never, get, never gets to zero and that's where uh, the attacker is able to drain the funds from the smart, smart contract uh, in real time. So the DAO is like a, you, you think of it then like a decentralized like venture capitalist. So people actually put money there and uh, they could actually invest in other projects. But because of this bug, you can see that the Ethereum and Ether is being taken away in real time and uh, it's like watching a bank robbery in uh, real time and you can't do anything about it. So this is something that's uh, pretty interesting. Um, also just to share very briefly on a few other exploits is that what we call transaction ordering dependence. And this means that if we have, uh, if we have two functions, update price and buy, the sequence of which goes first changes, over, changes depending on which transactions get ordered on top. Because it's a it's a it's a decentralized network, so you can't control which order it goes in. You can only control how much gas you want to put in. Um, so there's very there, um, there are ways that you have to make sure your some transactions are before other transactions. So finally, the last thing is that uh, uh, because like uh, transactions and computations are expensive on the blockchain, so you need to be very careful about your resource consumption. So what happens if you do not actually do that? So so let's say that I have an array that just keeps expanding over time. And I say that, okay, um, whenever I try to empty an array, and then, um, so whenever I want to win this lottery, I need to empty this array. But it may just be that when I, whenever I want to empty this array, uh, this may cost too much gas, and uh, it may be beyond the gas limit of a, of a certain block. So this might not be able to happen. So um, so same thing as, uh, as your programming on the smart contract, you have to be aware of the limitations of a blockchain network and how, um, how you master concepts like gas and, uh, and transaction uh, dependency. So um, I guess that's it. So um, there are just like um, lots of things to cover, but I just want to share with you some of these more interesting things uh, that will hopefully ignite your interest into blockchain programming and uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you.